It is, okay. So this interview is going to be a bit different than probably some past interviews because it's going to be less on naturism, but more on like the gender roles, mm -hmm. gender class. And I think naturism, you know, from listening to your podcast and partaking in some myself, pretty much influences, you know, gender roles in the family, you know, dynamic and everything. So I'm just curious to get started first. We have, she also wants to ask about the little past. So you don't mind just talking about your past and how you were raised and brought up. I know that you were brought up in a textile family, but you're also French Canadian. So was it more like a nuclear family where, you know, your dad worked and your mom stayed at home? Yeah, I had a very much uh, uh, ideal, at least from the 1960s, 70s ideal uh, family situation. I had, you know, one younger sister. My mother stayed home. My father worked. We had a, lived in a suburban house. Uh, just uh, everything that you kind of saw on TV, which is actually not what most people's experience necessarily was. By actually, right. I actually had it. So I had a very stable upbringing. And my parents are still together, and uh, yeah, it was pretty much just like the Leave It to Beaver family. Yes, just a little yeah. bit later. Yeah. So, was your was your mother college educated? No, my mother my mother's from Belgium. My mother is uh, was an immigrant to Canada after World War II. Uh, she was uh, she learned. Her skill set uh, from nuns in a school, and she learned how to scrub floors properly on your knees and all that stuff that they expected from women at the time. And uh, my father was French Canadian and learned English later, and he's an actuary. Well, he doesn't practice anymore. He's uh, my parents are 88 and 89 years old, um, and uh, yeah, so worked in life insurance companies all his life. Yeah. So even knowing your mom stayed at home and your dad worked because you know i'm assuming you were in were you would you grow up in the city like quebec or uh the first 12 years of my life i grew up uh just outside montreal okay. and then when i was 12 we my father was transferred to boston uh so i learned english there and then yeah. when i was 16 he was transferred again to the toronto area and i've been in this area ever since okay so because you will be in a more urban areas, I'm assuming they didn't. Your parents didn't shift how you saw gender roles, really. Like the woman stayed home and father work. I'm assuming. Did you see working mothers and working college ed educated women growing up? Uh, no, it was very rare. Most women were at oh. home with the children. Yeah. At that time, this was in the 1970s, so that was okay. the expectations, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's also funny, too, because I think in some parts, especially here in um, New England, I think that's when women really started working, you know, in cities like Boston, everything where, I, you know, I'm from. I, mean, I'm, I grew up in Providence. I'm in the Hartford area now. Sure. But New England kind of still has that kind of progressivism to it. Well, yes, but when you talk about women starting to work in the 70s, it wasn't uh, women my mother's age. Uh, it was right. a younger women. Uh, in the 70s, my mother had young children, right? Uh, yeah. In 1976, I was 10 years old. So uh, the younger women were starting to work more, and certainly it was a liberation. And some, some women who were in very bad marriages no longer felt obligated to stay in them. Um, and in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, you started to see a lot of divorce as a result. That's true, yeah. The and also, too, because of no law, a woman, too, got married for the protection of finances and shelter and home and all of that, the um, patriarchal system. Yeah, that's there. And that was the, expe the expectation and the obligation. In fact, when my, my mother and father met at work, my mother was working for an insurance company called Sun Life uh, with my dad. Um, and they met through work. And when they announced they were getting married, they... Uh, Gave her a goodbye party because you know you don't work when you're married and you certainly don't work in the same company as your husband no <laughs> well that shouldn't be going on now anyways because you know oh what's all what's going on in the news <laughs> oh it's definitely but, not happening anymore no, no. for sure no. that would but be very that offensive today do something too so you said the liberated movement later on in the 70s is that when you started becoming a naturist what was that journey like for you no i became 
I discovered naturism when I was in my late teens, early 20s. Uh, okay. And I would be, uh, you know, in the uh, mid to late 80s. So. And how did you make that journey? How did you come to it? Well, for me, it was that we would go to friends' cottages or we'd go camping. And often with that came skinny dipping, especially at night. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I did it enough that people started teasing me that I'm a nudist. And uh, at one point, somehow I decided, well, maybe I should look into that. Maybe I am. I don't know. And that's what started my journey into eventually uh, discovering naturism. And uh, then, you know, eventually uh, being on the board of the Federation of Canadian Naturists and its president and then owning a club. So that's my... Yeah, congratulations on being on the board. I thought, now, weren't you, this is a little aside from the interview, but weren't you on the board beforehand, but then you left, and now you're... Oh, you're talking about the International Naturist Federation. Yes, I was talking about the Federation of Canadian Naturists. I was on the board for 10 years and president for a few years, five, six years after that, of the Federation of Canadian Naturists. Um, I was on the uh, board of the International Naturist Federation. When was that? Uh about three or four years ago, or three years, okay. yeah. Yeah, I just remember you on the podcast, you were talking about some criticism of it and everything, and yep. Yep. not ready, yeah. And then I was just elected in October to be president of the International Naturist Federation. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So when do you really, because I know you say all the time, I say to my friends who to try to get involved, I say it's more than just, you know, taking your clothes off. There's a whole you know, health when it comes to when it comes to body image and self-esteem and, you, you know, when viewing yourself and everything else in positive and kind of like an anti-capitalism way, really, an anti-materialist way to, to it. When did you discover that in the process of naturism and it re- aligned with your views or did it always align with your views or did your views change after finding naturism? Well, I think like many people, uh, nat- I started in naturism because I just enjoyed the liberty, the freedom of uh, not wearing clothes. It, it was comfortable. Um, but I think when I discovered the organized naturism and I met others, I saw that, they, that the, the people were interacting with each other differently. And it, was a, it, was a, it seemed more comfortable. It seemed better. <laughs> and then, you know, I started hearing because then you start, you, you get the magazines. There was no internet at the time. You get magazines and maybe videos if you can find them, uh, occasionally newspaper stories. And you read out, oh, there's more to it. And to me, that sent me down the path of uh, really investigating and eventually joining as a volunteer, the Federation of Canadian Naturists. And it's been a lifelong journey of studying it ever since because it's it's in my personality to not just be happy with the way something is, but I need to understand why. Yeah, I agree with that. And I don't know if you have this, you know, feeling, but I actually learned a lot of it from your podcast, as I'm sure that, you know, other people have, too, because I was like about that. You know, I just. For me, growing up, I just never understood like the point of a bathing suit. I hated wearing one. I'm like, you know, it doesn't do anything. It's uncomfortable. And like, I never had with like shy in a locker room or, or anything. But then I started listening to your podcast, and, and I end up learning the, the, the whole philosophy. I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of stuff I already mm-hmm. believe, anyways. You know. But of course, you know, you said you, you mentioned magazines. I mean, you know, sometimes the magazines, as we all know, can give the mixed messages because I've seen some of these vintage magazines. Oh yeah, Especially they're very exploitive. In, yeah. Yeah, but some of them in German, but you know, I kind I got one at like a thrift store, and I used my the um, translation feature on my phone, and even though they have like regular, I had this. It was called. I have it on my shelf. It's called like nude and wet or something like that. And I'm thinking, you know, even though they they show natural families and everything here and regular people, all the articles are related to like sex and everything else, you know. Well, there's both sides. There was certainly there was a lot of magazines where the articles talked about naturism, but the pictures showed only mostly uh, young, uh, buxom women, and yeah. uh, that that was because uh, for a long time there was no ability to publish 
pornography, but the course had said that it was okay uh, to have naturist magazines because that was a, a valid movement. So there was a lot of exploitation, a lot of publishers who would just say, put the word nudist on the cover and put the words, so the words were right, but then really it was just a, a way of selling right. Soft core pornography at the time, so there's a lot of that that happened, and uh, and still does. You still find it on the yeah. web. It's, it's almost like a fantasy of nudists if you on online. So it's weird, yeah. But I also think the one I saw was more like the opposite of that. It had you know just like regular pictures of families, and then it had like a letter to the editor type of thing about fantasy. And I'm like, that's kind of creepy and weird, and that's very unusual. Usually it's the other way around. Yeah, yeah that's even more place. strange. Yeah. Yeah, so were you kind of like me, where like the stuff that you found about naturism, stuff that you already believed when it came to relationships and with people no. and that sort of thing, yeah? No, I wouldn't say that. Um, you know, I was very much a product of the society that I grew up in. Um, I didn't have uh, any of those issues you talk about thinking that bathing suits are stupid. I grew up expecting that you were. And in fact, I grew up with incredible body shame uh, because I'm a sort of a skinny body style. I probably would have been a great track runner. Um, and uh, so I skipped gym so I wouldn't have to change with the boys or shower with them. And uh, so to me, there was a, a strong sense of liberation and acceptance that came with naturism that um, I didn't know was possible. So it was quite uh, powerful from that standpoint. I would never expect that, you know, I, I would always, I, I would always, I just assume that you were probably more you know, you had that kind of positive view always. And you say, you know, growing up, you had shame as a male. Usually you hear it from the woman. But I think it's even worse now from the male because of platforms like Instagram. They show, like, you know, the perfect male with, like, you know, the big Tom Brady muscles and everything, which is, I think, just horrible. Yes. But even yeah. when I was growing up, you know, in 70s and 80s, the... Uh... The, the, the idealized high school male was a football player, uh, right. not a tall, skinny geek, which is what yeah. I was. Now, you said that you notice relationships in speaking and talking to people when you were there. Was that male and female speaking to equally or was it like the males in one section and the females in the other section? Because I know that in our society, there's a whole thing about, oh. If men talk to women, that means they like them, and women should avoid all men. Or if a man hangs out with all the girls, that means he's gay. Was did you find that at first in the naturism society? Definitely not in naturism, uh, but on mainstream to a certain extent. I never fit in particularly well. I always got along better with women, uh, and I had a lot of women friends through from high school and growing up. Um, I, that is one of the things actually that was quite striking. You know, you're, 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 when you go through adolescence and puberty, you become, uh, if you're heterosexual, which I was, uh, obsessed with uh, seeing, well, just nudity. You might, today it, might, it would be pornography and sexuality, but that was not available. The most I could get was a Playboy. And it was, while they were certainly posing in seductive uh, manners, it was not, sex it was just women nude women and then here i was hanging out with women who weren't wearing any clothes and it was not sexual and it was kind of liberating it was like okay it's it's there it is now i'm not don't have to you can have to go looking for it it's there and it's fine and we're all getting along and wow and i'm not like it's not a big sex party it yeah. was i liked it i liked the fact that that took away that whole obsession that existed in the mainstream world of you know, going to getting a look kind of thing, getting their clothes off kind of thing. Uh, you, you could get talk and get along and, and have conversations and they were just people. It, it, it was, a, you know, as early as in 19, the first version of the book, 1927, uh, called The New Gymnosophy by Dr. Maurice Parmalee, uh, an American, uh, is the first one that really describes naturism as a philosophy and an ideology that he saw in Germany. And so it published 1927, so he wrote it before that. And there's this uh, quote, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact word, but words, but it basically says that when men and women take all their clothes off together, the differences become less obvious, even though some are impossible to hide. Yeah. But uh, the, the differences become much less, and, and men and women are more equal. 
which is a weird thing for a man to say in nineteen in, or you know the nineteen twenties, when a lot of women didn't even have uh, the right to vote or own property at that point. But he and he thought it was desirable. He thought that was a good thing um, that nudity in naturism made men and women more equal. Would you say that's the same thing too, not just in the looks, but in the roles too? So I know that your family's nature is the kids are grown now, but when they were in, well, first off, I want to go back a bit. How, when did you decide in your progress of finding nature that this is how you wanted to raise a family? Well, once it became, you know, once I became very uh, convinced about that, and then I started dating my wife and we got married and they became part of our lives. And so it was natural. It wasn't a decision. It was just obvious. Uh, you know, if you, uh, it's the same thing. If you belong to a religion, you are just going to raise your children in that religion. Yeah. Not that naturism is a religion, but when you find something that you, is important, whose values matter, um, it, it wasn't even a discussion. It was just something that was going to be the way it was. And do you find that um, naturism changed the way that you brought up your family to when it came to gender roles? He said there was no difference between men and women. Do you think that had any impact, not just, you know, on body image of how you raise your sons, but on, you know, like, you know, the whole, like, you know, like, you know, men doing housework, too, and women doing housework? You know the kind of relationships that fathers have with their sons. Did that you think played any part at all? Um, so you know these things are all mixed together. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's definitely an aspect of that within naturism, but there's an aspect of that which I started developing well before I was a naturist, um, where I did not understand why men and women had such clearly separate roles and positions. Part of it, I think, and I'm just guessing, but when I was very young and I grew up, there were more girls in our uh, neighborhood than boys. But somehow I was excluded from playing with them. They had these games that looked fun, but I wasn't allowed to do it. And I remember that. I remember feeling excluded. And I'm going, well, so why can't I play? Because you're a boy. I remember having that too, yeah. 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 And so that was, you know, that, that was early on. And throughout... Uh, but I grew up with a lot of the same perceptions of gender roles as everybody else. It's everywhere. It's hard to avoid, many of which still exist today. Um, uh, one of the books that I read in university, which had an impact on me, was uh, Naomi Klein's The Beauty Myth. Uh, that really made me... We, we talk about that in class, yes. Which really made me kind of see things differently. Also, having... Uh, because I always had female friends... Uh, that I wasn't dating, I got a perspective which some men never get because they never hang out with women. And I got to understand what it's like to be from them, from hearing that from them. Um, I, I, I believe that we, 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 we have, and I've grown over my lifetime to really understand this, that we put far too much emphasis on gender roles. That it's very much a construct and it's not necessary. And so, uh, you know, at Bear Oaks, there are no gendered washrooms. There's no men's and women's washrooms. Uh, there's just toilets and you use the toilet. And, you know, it's not like it's open. You go into a little separate cubicle space and you're by yourself anyway. So the whole idea of having these, these separations. And then when you add naturism, where you're, you're nude together, then it seems even less logical to have separation. So... Why would you have a male locker room and a female locker room? And right. and I've seen that. I've seen male and female locker rooms in naturist and nudist clubs. So it's like, you know, the men go there and the women go there. They take their clothes off. They come out naked. I'm going, well, that's what's the point of that? But some people think it's important still. Um, it, none of it's logical to me. And what I see is two genders who often don't understand each other because they are they are segregated. They, they don't go to separate schools anymore, but they're still segregated. When they go to a party, they the men hang out with the men, the women hang out with the women. When they are at school, the, there's women's groups and men's groups. The, the mixing together um, is still a problem where they say, you know, there's we'll have a girls' night uh, or we'll have a boys' night. Uh, why? 
what, what what's is that the the difference exists but do they have to is there a reason that women can't enjoy watching the hockey game is there a reason that men can't sit around talking about you know life and how it feels to to be things and that kind of stuff uh like it, it i, I think when you mix them you find that both are quite capable there's differences we're not the same i'm not saying and, we're the same and, and it sounds like you you'll say it's easier to mix it in a nature's environment than a textile environment i think i think it promotes that because you know yeah. part of the rationale of for separation often is because you're taking your clothes off the nudity right. aspect whether it's the change room or the gym and those become places for women and men to escape together and act in a very different way because of expectations but once that's taken away and you don't you, it's not that you don't allow it it's just that there's no logical time to make that separation i think it promotes uh, a lot more mixing together and having more mixing together promotes a better understanding of each other it's astounding how many men don't understand women and women don't understand men it's not yeah. that hard so i mean so it sounds like you know from what you're telling me that your sons were probably you know raised right and weren't raised with those you know stereotypes of society put on you know uh seen here in the west so when they were growing up were they able to kind of flux more in high school and middle school and with their friends talk between males and females or because for the day when they weren't at home or at, you know, Bear Oaks or in a textile world, do you think it was harder for them or were they more easily able to adapt? No, I think, I think my children, because of our attitude. Now, my, my wife stayed home. My wife was a stay-at-home mom. That's okay. a decision we took together. So in a way, that was fairly traditional. But we were very much equals, and they saw that in how we lived our lives and made decisions. We just have clear definitions and they would not assume that a stay-at-home mom is a typical role because it's actually kind of rare between uh, the friends and what they saw out there in society so they saw uh you know two people that had friends of both genders and we we never once to have parties where the women hang out in the kitchen and men hang out in the living room watching the games that just wasn't us so uh, and then you throw in the naturism where you, you take away the, the the nudity separator that exists and the the obsession with uh, the objectification because a very strong value of naturism is to get away from objectification and hypersexualization. And yeah, I think they grew up with a different view of what male female relationships were like and a better understanding of what women were like, despite the fact sure, that yeah. we have a household that is three men and one woman. Yeah, and so I'm. Mean, so it sounds like too. You were probably I'm just guessing cooking, cleaning, and doing all the house some some housework too. You guys probably you I, and your wife probably share. Yeah, I, yeah. I happen to cook. Um, obviously, my wife did more of the household chores because she was home. Yeah. Uh, but I tend to cook because I like to cook. Uh, Linda's a good cook, but she's a, more of a cook by ne for necessity, uh, whereas I I enjoy cooking. So I tend to do more cooking than they do. Yeah. Um, there was no. Yeah, I don't think any, they saw it as a gender. I think they just saw that we each had our responsibilities. Um, you know, just because she does domestic stuff does not mean it's a woman's job. I don't think they ever saw it that way. I think they saw that mom is the one that stayed home. And I'm just curious, how did you come to, because you are nature, so you do seem pretty, you know, progressive. How did you come to that decision that she would stay home and be a stay-at-home mom? It's what she wanted to do. What do you want to do? That's excellent. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It wasn't my decision. It was not something I would ever suggest to somebody who doesn't want to. Yeah. Uh, but she she wanted to do that. It was it was difficult economically, um, but it's a decision. I mean, it's a decision we took together. But it was ultimately her choice. Um, you know, what, the most important thing to be a good mother is to be happy. If you're not happy in what you're doing then you're not a good mother. doesn't matter if you stay home. That doesn't make you a better mother if you resent it. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's true for any human being. We, we, we have to want to do what we do. Otherwise, we're not particularly good at it.
So I, I totally agree with that. I got a question here on my screen. It's you kind of already answered it, but um, I'm just curious, as like a nature, what is your perspective looking into the textile world on like the roles that you know the media puts on you know gender roles? and femininity and masculinity in the role of women, like, how do you view it? Do you view it as, like, poison, toxic, like, something that you can't relate to? Oh, no, I totally understand it, because I study it all the time, because it's it's my fascination. So I understand it. I Do I relate to it? No, I guess I, I understand, oh, but I understand it. That's It's not my thing. But I, I the naturism adds a whole aspect of being aware of clothing. You know, I walk by... Victoria's Secret store. And the whole story to me makes no sense. It's a ridiculous concept. And the fact is that a lot of women wear frilly underwear that nobody ever sees, but they know they're wearing it. It makes them feel better about themselves is a problem. It, it suggests that too far too much of their identity and their self-confidence is artificial and based on factors to what they look like. Uh, the, it, it's, you know, you, you look... You look at uh, volleyball, you know, we, we play a lot of volleyball barracks. So I often watch the volleyball teams for uh, in the Olympics and the women are wearing the little skimpy outfits and the men are wearing the long shorts. Well, there's something wrong with both of them, in my opinion. One, I think the outfit that women are wearing are actually better, more comfortable, likely, um, because they, they're less restrictive. They're big board short things, but no guy would wear a speedo like bottom while playing volleyball because they would be laughed out. Uh, and no woman would wear the board shorts because they're supposed to be sexy. And it's part of their appeal and it's part of the role they're supposed to play. But it, it, it's ridiculous that they are playing the same sport and we're all supposed to be equal yet. There's such an incredible difference in their uniforms. And that's it's you see as a naturist, you that becomes even more evident and obvious because you start to see that the role of clothing has nothing to do with protection. It has to do with fitting in and, and projecting a certain image. Right. And also, I think some of it, too, is going by. I think some of it, too, is getting approval, too. You know, well, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Get, acceptance yeah. and judgments. And yeah, you know. And I think that's what I think Instagram and all that stuff has caused a lot more to it. You know, the more likes you have, I think it's become a lot more toxic, too. And, of course, it's that whole argument that you always get into about the mm -hmm. double standard when it comes to social media with blocking nature stuff. You know, a picture of mine was I got I got a strike against me over the summer from Facebook. Because I posted a photo from um, Solaire. In, in Connecticut, the nature yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, here's the thing next. Is, so, since the time being a kid to the Dell, um, how do you think that kind of brings me over here? Since the time you're a kid to the Dell, do, or do you see a more positive change in the gender dynamics, or do you think it's gotten worse or better Both. over time? Both. Uh, women definitely have greater equality in a lot of ways. But it's certainly not. They haven't achieved complete equality. And women are still particularly kept down by uh, gender specific rules. Um, clothing is and what they wear is, is a big one. G women are still taught that their greatest value is what they look like to others. Not, not who they are. Uh, it's still the more important things is how hot they are, how sexy. It's something that's perpetuated not just by men, but by women as well. Um, it's not part of a plot. It's just something we're all perpetuating together as a group. And so that hasn't gone away. And the self-esteem that's based on that is still a problem. Now, what I'm seeing is that's happening more and more to men. So to a certain extent, we are going towards equality by equally screwing up both genders and make them all self-conscious and uncomfortable with what they look like. So that's not good either, uh, but it won't be the same equality. It'll be a different uh, equality of screwed upness if we keep going in this direction. But there's no question, there's no more rules about who can have what job. And there's a lot of pressure to make sure that there's 
uh, equality. We're not quite there, but there's equality in terms of pay, at least in North American uh, societies. But you still have very much men's stuff and women's stuff, and you don't feel welcome in the other world if you're part of one world, you can now welcome in the other world. So there's still a long way to go. I heard this quote recently on this public radio. This, you know, this by happenstance, and I just turned it on to a program. You know, NPR is, you know, our public radio here in the States. And it says that capitalism would fall apart in two seconds if women just suddenly stop feeling, stop caring about the way they look in public. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. It would fall apart. It would probably shift in a different direction, but it would definitely have a big impact because they spend a lot more on clothing than men do. You just have to look at all the stores that are out there and the percentage that's dedicated to women's clothing versus men's clothing. Right. So there's no question it would have a huge impact. But don't worry, capitalism will find another way to... If you don't spend your money one way, you spend it another. And we saw that during the pandemic. People couldn't oh, yeah. travel. So what did they spend it on? Suddenly they started renovating everything. So, you know, they, we, 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 uh, we, we, we want to spend our money. We find ways to do it. So I think it would, there would be a big upheaval, but I don't think it would collapse. Oh. Um, so I got one last question here for you. And that is, so, and it kind of sounds like you are, are you more, are you optimistic for the future? Yeah, but I'm an optimist. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. I think, but, but we can't give up. I'm optimistic that the, the, we, there's a lot of desire and will to go in the right direction, but it is hard and it is a challenge and there's a lot of resistance. I see, for example, a lot of a uh, strong movement with younger women uh, refusing to conform to the beauty myth and refusing to be driven by it. And a lot of talk about body acceptance and all that. And that's great, but it's easier said than done. Um, and sometimes when you're young, it's also hard to give up because there is power. It's, it's, it's a fleeting power. It's an artificial power and ultimately it hurts you, but there is power that when you dress and you go to the bar and you look really hot, uh, you get all your drinks bought for you for free. And, you know, there's a certain, uh, feeling of strength and power because society says that's, that's important. So I hear, uh, I talk to young women, uh, because we employ many of them at Bear Oaks, and they all say the right things, but they don't necessarily act the right way because it's hard to give that up. It's so um, fundamental to uh, the society that we live in. What he says, one of those things is about, you know, environment. So if they're at the Bear Oaks environment, they feel that way, but then as soon as they go back to like downtown Toronto, it just kicks in like, oh, I can't be this way anymore. Yeah. I need to act. Yeah. And it's not just Bear Oaks. Bear Oaks definitely attracts more young people who are believe in, in that. But even in mainstream society, you still have that. You still have women who are, you know, they're not naturists, but they don't believe uh, that their greatest value should be what they look like. And that's enslaving. And that let's celebrate the variety of people. And I'm not going to shave my legs or whatever it is. Uh, just because I don't feel like conforming all the time. Uh, but then they do because they're going to a wedding, so they should shave their legs or, or something like that, or because people are going to judge them or they think they might not get a job. I mean, that's just one example, shaving your legs I'm throwing out there. There's many examples. And I, you know, there's a very popular video that we did uh, that's approaching 2 million views for Bear Oaks about what a first time visit looks like. And one of the women uh, doesn't shave her legs or, or arms, or armpits, sorry. And the number of uh, men that have commented on that, how disgusting it is, it's just astounding still that they there are people who think that they have the right to have an opinion about that. And then and even if they don't like it, that it they have they should share that and they should try to make somebody feel bad by telling them how disgusting they think it is. I mean, it. You know, there's probably people who don't like my mustache. I don't care. That's their right. problem. Fortunately, we don't live in the world where, for men, people are going to come up to me and goes, I think mustaches are gross. Nobody would ever do that. No. But somehow men feel, mostly men, feel that it's okay to come up to a woman and say, oh, I think unshaved legs is gross. 
Yeah. Like, it's not your legs, dude, but yeah. somehow that's that's still part of it. So long answer to your question. Yeah, I think there is a uh, a balance. Um, there's a good future, um, but it's going to be a hard fight to get there. That does bring me to another question, though. I just thought of, though. So obviously, you know, it sounds like your sons won't, aren't like that. But do you find, I know that there's many families and many generations now at Bureau. You probably start kids you know, grow, you know, grow up there. Would you say that, you know, other boys who grew up at Bear Oaks who are in their, you know, their 20s now or teenagers, are they less likely to make comments like that too? Of like, hey, you can shave your legs and a less, you know, objectifiable of women. Um, I would say yes, but it's certainly not universal. I mean, the greatest factor in growing up is in, in how you're raised are your parents. And are there naturists who go for this whole beauty myth and judging of people? Yes, of course there are. Um, that doesn't, in, in my opinion, that goes against the basic philosophy, but you've got a whole range, right? When I started, as I said, it was like skinny dipping and it was fun and it was about feeling good and comfortable. There's people who never go beyond that. They never really get into why and what's right and wrong and what are the morals and ethics. That includes to the, even the people who bring their families there, just not the single people. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sure. There's a there's a there's a man whose daughter uh, left naturism pretty much as soon as she got into puberty. And when I went to his house, I saw that he had posters in his office at his house of nude or semi-clad women all over and they were not average women they were all a certain type of women so he you know she grew up with a father who had that view um and of course that affected how she thinks men view women and what women's roles are and what's important so for her once she became a teenager she realized that she was nude and she was probably being looked at that way maybe even by her dad i don't know that's taking it pretty far I don't know what's in her head, but it's parents are the biggest impact. Uh, the, the naturism is not a panacea that solves all the problems you need. You know, my, the kids go to school and they have friends and their friends may become more of an influence if they don't have good friends in naturism. So but at least if they grew up in naturism, they see an alternate narrative that they might not see somewhere else. And hopefully that does have an influence. But does that raise make perfect? Young men, not necessarily. Does it make women who don't care about what they look like? No, not necessarily. I think that's a great way to end it. I want to thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. To to talk. Yeah. And just to tell you, I'm probably going to talk to you sometime in the future because I do hope eventually to make a trip up there. I, mean, I was supposed to go two years ago, but, you know, the whole country got shut, the whole world got shut down. Cool. Um yeah, and I have for my end my thesis, my graduating thesis, I plan on writing about um nudism and naturism and how it's portrayed in the media. So I'll probably definitely come back to you for more okay. information on that later on. And this assignment that uh, you're doing, is that written? Yes, it's supposed to be a written assignment. Okay, and well I'd be interested in seeing a copy. Yeah, of course, I will, yeah. We're supposed to have like one or two interview one or two people. And their perspective, you know, on gender roles and how it's changed throughout the um, throughout the decades. And I thought, you know, why not do a, a nature? You know, and I mean, who sure. what not a better you know, nature than you no know, Stefan, you know, because, you know, you're kind of seen as, you know, I don't want to make you feel like a, a big crown of you. But I think in the nature community, you're kind of seen as like the king nature especially here in the west you know well thank you that's very kind yeah uh, I, I, I talk to other people at different clubs and resorts and of course everyone has heard of you that's nice that's nice well yeah. I, I hope uh i hope my ideas are good and i hope that those ideas will help others then all right well thanks so much and have a great rest of your day okay thank you take care josh bye. you too bye, -bye. bye.